You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Thinking Talmudist. It is so awesome to be here with everyone. And uh, today we're going to change Talmuds. Last uh, couple of weeks, we talked about what happened when Pharaoh tried to kill all the baby boys. We spoke about Moshe's father. We spoke about Moshe, the light that he brought into the, into the world. Today we're going to talk about a verse in the Torah. In last week's Torah portion, that reads as follows. By Yomer Hashem Moshe, and Hashem said to Moshe, Alei Eli Hahara, ascend to me up the mountain. Veheye Sham, and remain there. Veetna Lacha, and I will give to you Esluchos Evan, the tablets of stone, Vah Torah, and the Torah, Veha Mitzvah, and the commandment, Asher Kosafti, that I have written, Lehoro Sam, to teach them. So we, obsess over the following fact in every one of our classes, and that is that there isn't a single extra word, a single extra letter in the entire Torah. But if you read this verse carefully, you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of redundancy. It's very repetitive. I will give to you the tablets of stone, the Torah, the mitzvah, that I wrote, lahoro sam to Teach to them. What is all of this? You can just say, this is the Torah that I'm giving to the Jewish people. Instead, no, 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 it's a whole long thing. The tablets of stone, the Torah, the mitzvah, that I wrote to teach them. Says the Talmud in Brachot, Hey, Amad Aleph, which is Hey, A. Amar Rabbi Levi Bar Chama, Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish. Rabbi Levi Bar Chama said, and Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said as follows. My dechsev, what does it mean when the verse says, Ve'et nalacha, es luchos ha'even, ve'at Torah va'a mitzvah sher kasafti lorosam. This verse that we just read, the Talmud is asking, what, what does this mean? Why is there this redundancy? Seeming redundancy. Luchos, says the Talmud. What does it mean when it says luchos? Luchos are the tablets. Elu aseres adibros. That is the Ten Commandments. How do we know that? Okay, well, he's going to explain it all. Torah, what does Torah mean? Zemikra. That's referring to Scripture, to the Torah. Umitzvah, vehamitzvah, and the commandments. What is that? Zo Mishnah. That refers to the Mishnah. Asher Kasafti, that I have written. What's that? Elu Nevi'im Uksuvim. That is the prophets and the writings. Lehorosam, to teach them. What's that? Ze Gemara. This refers to the Gemara. Melamed, the Talmud says now. Shekulam Nitnu Lemosha Misinai. This verse teaches us that all of them were given to Moses at Sinai. So here we thought that only one thing was given to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. One thing. The revelation at Mount Sinai. They got, they got the Ten Commandments. And that's it. Everything else was later. The rabbis, because we know, of course, everyone says the rabbis made up all the laws. And the rabbis wrote the Mishnah. And the rabbis wrote the Talmud. And the rabbis... Wanted to make our lives miserable. God forbid. Heaven forbid. Here the Talmud clearly tells us that this verse goes out of its way to emphasize each and every one of these things to teach us that no, the Mishnah and the Talmud and the Kabbalah and the Midrash, I've heard so many people, even sadly some people call themselves rabbis. They say, ah, Midrash. (laughs) Midrash is just like the, the storybook that, you know, that we read our kids at night, and it's it's not it's just you know fairy tales. No, midrash is Torah too, by the way. Midrash, midrash was also given at Mount Sinai. 
He was, oh, so it's one second. So you're, you're looking and you're like, what? Rabbi, how can it be? We see stories that happen later. So let's understand something. The Although the word mikra generally refers to the whole of Scripture, the Gemara here understands it in a narrower sense to mean just the Torah, the five books of Moses. The root of mikra is kra, which means read or read. And mikra literally means that which is read. Thus, in its narrow sense, it refers to the Chumash, to the five books of the Torah, which must be read in its entirety in the synagogue. So anytime you see the word kra, which means read, it's referring to the Torah. Because the Torah is being read, as we know, every week. We read the entire portion. And every year we conclude all of those 54 portions of the Torah, and we conclude the entire Torah. That ends and begins... Every year at Simchas Torah. So Simchas Torah, we end Vizos HaBracha at the end of Deuteronomy. And we begin Bereshis, the beginning of Genesis, again, the same exact day. We take the Torah, we roll it all the way to the front, to the beginning, and we start Genesis. Every year we do this full cycle of the Torah. So anytime you see the idea, the concept of Mikra, which means something that is read, or Kra, it's referring straight to the Torah, the five books of the Torah. Since the Mishnah usually teaches the basic commandments without expanding upon them, the verse refers to it simply as mitzvah, commandment. God is telling us that in addition to the Torah, he will also give us the Mishnah, and that too should be studied. So what does it mean that the Torah was, the Mishnah was given to us at Mount Sinai? So we've given many examples over the years. We'll just repeat a few of them. The Torah does not tell us how to perform the mitzvahs. It only tells us what to do. It doesn't say how to do. So for example, it tells us to put tefillin on our head and our, on our arm, but it doesn't say what to fill in are. It says to put a mezuzah on your door, but it doesn't say what a mezuzah is. There's nowhere where it tells us what it is. We just learned yesterday in our Living Jewishly podcast, we learned chapter, I think this is the 13th podcast, and we episode 13, where we did the entire laws of mezuzah, and nowhere in the Torah does it tell us what the mezuzah is. It says put a mezuzah on your door, but we don't know what it is. Nowhere in the Torah does it tell us what a mezuzah is or what to fill in are. It tells us to slaughter an animal, animal properly before eating it. It doesn't tell us how to slaughter it. And so on and so forth. You look at the majority of the mitzvahs of the Torah and the Torah tells you what to do, but it does not give you the guidance of how to do so that's problematic. So how do we know that what we are observing in our own homes with the laws of mezuzah, with the laws of tefillin, how do we know that we're doing it properly? How do we know that the prayers that we're reciting is proper? Yet it was constructed by the men of the great assembly, but maybe they got it wrong. So we have to understand that what went on when Moses ascended the mountain? Moses went up the mountain, and it says, if you look at the verse, the verse that we read just before, and that verse was from Exodus chapter 24, verse 12. Alei Eli Hara. Ascend to me to the mountain, ve'yesham, and remain there. Meaning, don't just come and go. You're going to stick here for a while. Stick around here for a while. How long is a while? 40 days. Rashi immediately says, Memyo, 40 days. You're going to stay there for 40 days. Okay, so listen to this interesting commentary here in the Art Scroll. The Art Scroll says, and, you shall gi- and I shall give you, 
referring to the tablets and the Torah and the mitzvah and the commandments, okay, all of that. The verse specifies tablets, teaching, and commandment. What, are, what were they? According to Rashi, citing Rebbe Sadia, all 630 commandments are subcategories of the Ten Commandments, so, th- so that all three categories are implied in the tablets. Ramban comments that the tablets were the Ten Commandments that I have written, and the rest of the Torah was not written by God. It was not written by God. Who wrote it? But would be transmitted to Moshe to teach them to teach the people. Sforno adds, teaching as a as the philosophical, intellectual aspects of the Torah and commandments as the rituals that must be performed. So when Moses goes up the mountain, he's going to be there for 40 days. What's going to happen there? He's just going to chill and have coffee with, with God? Yeah, let's have some espresso. Okay, so 40 days is a lot of time. So we have to understand that in order for the Torah not to be a complete and total mystery, we need to understand what's going on here. Because we don't want the Torah to become an irrelevant document. If the Torah is to be, like it is, the most widely purchased book on planet Earth, it still is, the Bible is still the best-selling book in the history of the world. Why? Because who's the author? God's the author. Transcribed by Moses. God's the author. You want to know what God wants? Well, learn his Torah. But it's not enough to just learn the Torah. Because then we won't know all of the explanations for all of the mitzvahs. How do we get the clarity? How do we get the understanding that comes with the Torah? We have to learn everything else that was given to Moshe as well during those 40 days. The Rambam writes in the introduction to the Mishnah Torah, to Yesodia Torah, the foundations of the Torah, he says that everybody had a notebook. Moses had a notebook, and Aaron had a notebook, and the elders had a notebook, and the sages had a notebook. And they wrote down whatever they were, all the headlines, all the details that they were able to write. Because here Moses goes up the mountain, he comes back down, and his face is beaming. His face is beaming. Why? Here's a guy who for 40 days was being infused. You can't call him a guy. He's Moses, right? He's the greatest prophet ever to live. Who's beaming. Because he was just infused with the greatest connection with the Almighty ever, where the Almighty is teaching him the Torah. Here you know the Torah. What does it mean? Here, this box is exactly what the tefillin are. And you see this is the mezuzah. It should have these two portions that talk about mezuzah in it. And it should be on a scroll. And how should an animal be slaughtered? And each detail of the Torah was given to Moshe. Moshe comes down. He says, guys, 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 let's stop the part. What, what's going on? A golden calf, right? It becomes a big problem. And then finally, he's able to seek atonement for the Jewish people, as we'll see in two weeks' Torah portion. And now they're able to learn about the Torah. They're, learn, they're able to learn about the mitzvahs. Every single detail of what's later going to be transcribed in the Mishnah and in the Talmud and in the Halacha and in the Midrash, every single one of those was outlined by Moshe to the greatest detail. And for the next 80, next 40 years, while the Jews were in the desert and before Moshe died, he gave over everything that he was possibly capable of giving over. The Mishnah, the first Mishnah in Ethics of Our Fathers, is very interesting, the terminology. It says, Moshe kibel Torah misinai. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai, from God at Sinai. Umasar li Yeshua, and passed it to Joshua. 
And Joshua passed it to the elders. And the elders passed it. If you listen, what's the exact terminology in the Mishnah? It doesn't make sense. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai. It doesn't say that Joshua received the Torah from Moses. It says that Moses passed it on, and Joshua passed it on, and, and, the, and the elders passed it on. Why doesn't it say that they received it just like Moshe received it? Because Moses received the Torah from the Almighty himself. Here's the amazing thing. Every class participant takes about 90, if they're a good student, they'll take 90 to 95% of what the teacher presents. 5% is lost. That's a good student. They say that the retention of information is about 30%. That's, studies show that it, in a good case, it's 30%. But I'm, I'm, I think everyone gets it. So imagine it's 95%. What happened to that 5%? Now, when you go teach what you learned because you're so inspired, you come to the thinking Talmudist, and you're like, wow, this was amazing. I'm going to go share this with my friends. And you get your group of friends together. How much of what you present are they going to get? It keeps get, getting cut down by another 5%, another 5%, another 5%. So now what happens? Moshe receives... From the Almighty, he gets the whole package, everything. But him to be able to, he can't convey it like God does. He's not God. So what does Joshua get? He only gets 95%. And what does Joshua give over? 95%. And what, is the, what do the prophets give over to the elders? 95%. And the elders to the rest of the people? 95%. So each one is getting trimmed down a little bit. Not because there's an intentional short in what they're presenting, but in the limitation of the conveyor. I only got 95%. I'll give you everything I've got. They only receive... That's, by the way, one of the secrets. It's one of the secrets of why we respect our elders. Because think of how much... Think of how much more... Inform, think of how much more information they have than we have. Even if it's just 5% more, they're 5% more enriched with Torah. Which is why in Judaism, the older someone is, the more authority they have in the Torah. Why? Because they're closer to the source. It's an amazing thing. So here you have, Moses goes up to, up to Mount Sinai. He gets what? He gets also the tablets, also the Torah, also the prophets and the writings, also the Mishnah, also the Talmud. Everything. And that's orally transmitted. So here, the Midrash tells us that all of the animals descended to one place multiple times. All of the animals from the entire earth arrived at one place multiple times. There's a disagreement whether it's three times or four times. The first was when Adam had to give everyone names. Where would we get the name dinosaur from if we didn't get it from Adam? What's a dog? Kelev. It's Kolev. It's all heart. In each one of the animals, he was able to connect with them and understand what their essence is and name them by their essence. So all the animals descended to Adam, gave each one a name, and then he says, wait, what's my name? Ah... I'm from the earth, so call me earth, Adam, because I'm from Adama. Anyone who's been to the Muslim Masterclass, we know we discussed this multiple times. That that's not the case. That's not why he was named Adam. He was named Adam not because he's just from the earth. He's named Adam because Adam is like Adame, which is to emulate. Our job in this world as human beings is to emulate God. That's our job. Be God-like. Be a representative of God in this world. Show the world what it means to be a person of God. The way we act, the way we forgive, the way we are kind, the way we're generous, 
All of these things are godly traits. The way we're patient. Oh, that's what Adam realized. He realized, yeah, all of the animals have functions, but none of their functions is to emulate God. That's what we're here for. Right, so here's the thing is that, think of it like this. How can you create a software for code that's not yet written? You see, he gave us the answer. Because you create the frame and the structure for all of that information that's later going to be created. Yeah, the actual storyline, that's the storyline given by Joshua, given by Samuel, but Isaiah, all of the prophets and the writings, and, and King David and King Solomon. But the framework of it all was given already at Mount Sinai. We actually studied that Talmud of what happened, what transpired when Moses ascended up to the heavens. And the angels say, what's a, a human that comes from, that, that was born from a woman? What is this guy doing here? And as, as we know, Moses says to them, well, why should you get the Torah? Do you guys have a Yetzirah? Do you guys have an evil inclination? Do you guys desire to do sin? No. Do you guys have free will? No. So why should you get a Torah? What, what's it going to make a difference to you? And they're like, you know what? You're right. And then they blessed Moshe uh, on, on the receiving of the Torah. See, he was up in the heavenly realms, right? We don't understand. We don't try to get delve into that too much. But the basic idea is, yeah, God created the framework within which the angels, the, 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 sorry, the prophets, within which the prophets are going to prophesy. All of that structure is put in the Torah already, in what was given to Moshe. All of the messages that were given from Joshua and all of the lessons that we learned from all of the prophets and the writings and the Mishnah and the Talmud was all given to Moshe. Now, that Rebbe, Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi, that he wrote, when he wrote the Mishnah, he wrote it in a way of conversation. We have an argument between Hillel and Shammai. And the Talmud was written by Ravina and Ravashi in a form of conversation, in a form of asking questions, so that's in, that it's engaging. But the principles of what's written in the Torah was all given to Moshe already. And you know what it says? It says that what was revealed to Moshe was able to be released to this world. What was not revealed to Moshe will never be released. It means there's parts of Torah that was not revealed to Moshe. One of the things that Moshe was very, very um, adamant about is he wanted to understand the red heifer. God says, this you're not going to understand. This, this is hidden from you. But I want to know. No, this is not for you. Uh, in, in modern day context, our sages tell us that it's important for parents sometimes to make rules and don't give reasons. Children need to learn that they have to listen to rules even when they don't understand it. Because if they only follow rules they understand, they'll have a hard time following the speed limit. I understand there are no cars here. There's no cars here. Why shouldn't I go on a red light? And it, it, what, what happens is that then there's no... There's no... Um, there's no... <laughs> It becomes problematic. Let's put it, put it like that, okay? This, it becomes problematic. But either way, let's get back to the, the, what was given to Moshe. So what was given to Moshe was the entire package of the Torah. What was later to be revealed by Rav Yehuda Anasi, Judah the Prince, when he wrote the Mishnah, and later by Ravina and Ravashi when they wrote the Talmud, all of this was already revealed to Moshe. They took the books of Moshe. They took the notebooks from all the prophets and all, the, all, all of the elders and then assembled them. It was an unbelievable work to put the Mishnah exactly the way the Mishnah was written in six specific orders. Right? All of the 60 books of the Mishnah are organized in six orders, six different departments. That's a godly insight that was given from God to Moses at Mount Sinai already. So, yeah, that what, what was later to be 
what was later to be revealed in the Mishnah by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is what was revealed already by Moshe at Mount Sinai. There's nothing new here. Everything that is given to us, every single word that we learn today, and every single lear- word that we learn in every one of our classes and podcasts and videos is Torah that was already given to Moshe at Mount Sinai. We can have a fresh packaging to it, but it's still the same pre-baked Torah that was given at Sinai. Right, so th- the question is what we understand the Torah is. Do we understand the Torah to mean these words of Bereshit bara Elohim? Do we understand the Torah, or do we understand the Torah as what is the blueprint of the world? And if we understand that it's the blueprint of the world, you have a blueprint before you start building. So the blueprint was around, it says, Yisrael, Oraisa, Bikutcha, Brichu, the three things that were around before the world was created is God, God's before anything, the Torah, which is the blueprint of the world, and the Jewish people. The Jewish people weren't around yet. They weren't in Egypt. They weren't slaves yet. They weren't freed. The concept of having a people that are going to be the chosen people, that concept was already around, baked into the creation of the world prior to creation. You think that anti-Semitism is a new thing? (laughs) That's pre-baked into the world. Guys, it says, we learned this also. This was a previous podcast. You can listen to it on the Thinking Talmudist podcast. It was an entire class we dedicated to why the Torah was given at Sinai. Sinai rhymes with the word Sina. Sinai is the Sinai Desert. But it also rhymes with the word word in Hebrew of sinna, which is hatred. You know what descended with the Torah? Hatred. The nations are forever going to be hateful, spiteful, jealous because we receive the Torah. And it makes a lot of sense. It makes total sense. I understand it. I would also be spiteful and hateful if I wasn't a Jew. I mean, why wouldn't I? They got the lottery ticket that I was holding in my hand. I go to the store. I ask the guy for a ticket for the lottery to win $185 trillion, right? Because Judaism is worth more than that, right? And I have the ticket. And I say, you know what? I'm not going to win anyway. I just leave it there on the counter. The next guy says, you know, I'll get it. And he wins. What would, what would I feel towards that guy? The greatest hatred in the world. You took my ticket. You should give me some of it. You should this, split it. Uh, It's like, sorry. You didn't didn't take it. The entire world was offered the Torah. Every nation was offered the Torah. And they said no. And those who said yes are the future converts of the Jewish people. So the entire infrastructure of this world is in that blueprint. That's the Torah that we have. So, yeah, well, the, what, is, what is the soul? The soul, the soul is, an, God doesn't have pieces, so we can't say it's a piece of God, but it's a, a representation of God. God blew into your nostril when you were born a living soul. That's a, a sort of a breath of God. So yeah, so that was also part of it. It says that all the future souls of the converts were also by Mount Sinai. They're there. They were there at Mount Sinai. And all the future people that are going to be born, we're all a link to it. Right, so that's a whole Kabbalistic uh, uh, discussion whether or not there's a, there's a, uh, a, a limited amount of souls um, it's 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 a great discussion to have. I I don't I you know I think that we're all recycled goods here anyway, and we're all we're here once before. Uh, that's that that's my belief, and you're welcome to change my mind. Uh, but that's my that's my uh, that's my thought. I, I believe that we were we were. I believe that every one of us 
uh, who are born in this generation are recycled souls, probably from the Holocaust. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's my. That's my. That's my. Uh, no, no, I don't think anybody wants to be reincarnated. No, so here's the thing. I don't think anybody deviates from the Torah intentionally. I think anybody who deviates from the Torah is doing it mistakenly and is doing it um, notwithstanding what their soul wants. Uh, There's nobody on planet Earth who would ever, ever step away from the Torah knowing the treasure that it is. Not a single human being. Do you know someone who would see um, good, healthy food? Okay, so we're not going to talk about, oh, meats, oh, it's bad for you, whatever. Okay, we're not talking about that kind of person. We're talking about just wholesome food to nourish your body, and they say, no, I want to starve to death. No. They don't want to know. It's because they probably, most of the people, look, I, I've met, I would, I would say, let's say thousands of people over my 18 years here in Houston, and even those, I've met even those who say, oh, it just doesn't talk to me, Judaism. It's just not for me. Organized religion. I heard all of these stories, okay? Um, that God really isn't here. I believe in documentary theory. I believe in this. I believe in that, right? We, we, we went through all of the different types of people. Or God, how can God have done the Holocaust? It must be there is no God. I've heard those arguments. It's all coming from a place of pain. If anybody was exposed to true Torah, to true mitzvahs, to true... I'm not talking about, you know, delivering meals on wheels. That's a mitzvah, yes. I'm talking about connecting with the depths of what is going on when we do a mitzvah. When we're able to connect on the highest level of godliness, of spirituality, of Shabbos. Tell me a person who observed the Shabbos properly and says, you know, it's just not for me. It's just not for me. It's like you can imagine what is the greatest vacation you can ever possibly imagine. And it doesn't come close to Shabbos. I just want to get away. I just want to, that's what most people want on vacation. What do you want to do on vacation? You want to bring your office with you? No, you want to leave your office in your office and just go and clear your mind. That's what, that's what Shabbos is, but 10 times better because everything's prepared for you already. You prepared the food you like. You went and shopped before Shabbos for the greatest delicacies possible. And now you're living on an island. You're with your family, the people you love. You're able to go to synagogue and you're able to sing your, to your heart's delight. You're able to dance. You're able to meet your friends. You're able to be in an environment that is godly. Were you able to recharge your soul and connect with the Almighty? Recharge your relationships with your spouse, with your children, with your community? That's what Shabbos is about. I met an individual last night. And he grew up religious. And he's no longer religious. And we sat, I'm very tired right now. I went to sleep at about 3 o'clock last night um, talking with this individual. And after he was busy telling me all the reasons of why he made his decisions, he asked me, so what do you think? Which usually indicates that he's in a place of pain and he needs validation and he needs comfort in in, in his decision. Like, like, why would you care what I thought? He's like, who am I to to have a thought on your choice, choice for your life? But then I said to him, look, there's one thing that you said that pains me to my core is that you told me in our conversation that it doesn't bring joy to you. I said, I find that hard to believe, impossible. It's impossible. God gave us a Torah to enjoy and to have pleasure. And you don't find pleasure in it. There's something wrong here. Shabbos is the greatest day on planet Earth, and you don't enjoy it, something's wrong. Don't blame the Shabbos, because the Shabbos didn't do anything wrong, I guarantee you. You might have the wrong definition of what Shabbos is, 
And he says, well, I saw my father do this and I saw my father do that. And, you know, it was never a day off and it was always a day. We have to redefine what Shabbos. But to tell me that you don't derive the highest level of pleasure from Judaism, something's wrong. And to me, that's painful to hear. It's painful for me to hear that someone lives life without maximizing the pleasure of it. And to me, it's just like, I don't, I don't know how that's possible. I don't know how that's possible. I believe, I believe this firmly, that if we, each and every one of us, were able to observe one single mitzvah in its perfection, we would be in the highest high we've ever been in our entire lives and probably will ever be in our entire lives. One mitzvah in its perfection. I'm talking about properly connecting with the Almighty when you pass a mezuzah. It's a simple one. Yeah, we learned yesterday in the halacha that when you pass a mezuzah, you should touch it, recognize that God's presence is there, that God loves you, He protects you, He watches over you, He's there with you, and give it a kiss. Because it's a commandment in the Torah. You want a kiss? You see a, a book, a, a Torah book, Give it a kiss. Something which is holy. Something which connects us with the Almighty. If we one time, once in our life, actually were able to connect with the depths of that mitzvah of mezuzah, understanding what it represents, understanding the connection, the clarity that it brings us with the Almighty, we'd be dancing on the rooftops. We'd be the happiest people on planet Earth. And to me, it's tragic when I meet someone, tragic and painful when I meet someone who says, I just don't find joy in it. Something wrong. There's a, a corrupted file there. It's like when you're trying on your computer to just like it says, sorry, we can't find this. We can't find this file. There's, it's missing a, a, a something's, something's not right. It should operate. It should operate smoothly but we're in a world that has a lot of yetzahara now if he says listen i want to date non-jewish girls and i want to do whatever i want to do and just leave me alone with the rules that i hear but don't tell me it doesn't bring you pleasure to observe judaism don't put down the judaism you want to say listen i have a lot of you know urges they're out of control and I just want to do my own thing. I want to eat non-kosher food, and I want to, you know, do whatever I want to do. Okay, that's a different argument. Okay, so at least you're honest. But to put down the Torah, it, it, it just doesn't do anything for me. I'm better than the Torah. It just doesn't, it's not enough for me. No, God forbid. Spend time together. The proper way to spend time with any spouse on planet Earth in any relationship is spend time. Spend time together. Talking. Connecting. You know what? And also talking physically. It's fine. Meaning having intimacy. That's also part of communication. No, no, no. This is Torah. This is all part of the Torah here. Yeah. A relationship is supposed to be a, 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 a something that elevates the two. Where you're able to com completely connect with another person. Not only with words sitting on a couch. Not only holding hands and going for a walk. Not only eating a romantic dinner together. Candlelit dinner, by the way. Where do you think candles came at a nice fancy restaurant? You get candle, a candlelit dinner. It comes from our Shabbos table, my friends. 3,300 years ago, the Jewish people kept Shabbos and they lit two candles. Why? You know what the halacha says? Why? Because it makes the environment pleasant. What does that mean? I'll translate it for you. Romance. That's what it means. It means that it creates an aura. It creates an environment. Do you know what the man of the house, when he set, recites the Kiddush, do you know what he's supposed to do before he recites the Kiddush? He's supposed to gaze at the candlelights. Take it in. Take it in. Connect with the moment. That's what it's about. Yeah, so 
someone told us, oh, Shabbos, not to work. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm going to make, you know, a seventh less of money because God said some commandment 3,300 years ago when they lived in the desert and they didn't even have jobs. Do you think maybe God understands our world maybe a little bit better than you do? You think you're not going to make money by not working on the seventh day? You'll make more money in the other six days. It's all about building our relationship with ourselves, by the way. Having some private time. I was very, very inspired. I spent uh, maybe two and a half, three months ago, I was this scholar in residence at the Meyerland Minion. And Rabbi Bressler said such a beautiful idea, and it really touched my heart. He said, Shabbos, we're not in a rush. So why don't we take more time to daven? And it's such a good thought. It's such a proper thought. You see, during the week, yeah, we have to run to our job. We have to run to meet people and to give classes and to do this and do this. But you know what? On Shabbos, we don't have that. On Shabbos, we don't have to run around and be places. We can daven a longer davening. Talk to God more. Utilize the opportunity of no phone, no internet, no computers, no business meetings. Hashem, I have all the time in the world to just talk. To just talk. That's what Shabbos is for. Shabbos is a time that by the time Shabbos is done, we're wiped out. We are wiped out. We talk to the Almighty. We talk to our spouse. We talk to our children. We talk to our friends. We're able to connect. You need a Shabbos from the Shabbos. Find a way to connect with yourself. The most important thing, you know, my, my rabbi always says this. He says, don't encourage people to get married till they understand themselves. Because if you don't understand yourself, there's no way in the world you'll be able to understand someone else. You first have to know yourself. So perhaps the first mission of Shabbos is get to know ourselves a little. And the biggest fear people have is spending time themselves. People are terrified of spending time, time themselves. Shabbos gives us an opportunity to stop. Stop the run, the, the, the non-stop running after our tails constantly in, a, in an obsessive way. Non-stop. So we didn't even get to our Talmud yet. <laughs> we didn't even get to our Talmud yet. So, my dear friends, Hashem should bless us all that we should have the privilege of observing one perfect Shabbos, one perfect mitzvah. Because once it's one, it'll be forever. It's like when you tasted a certain food, you're like, oh, that's good. I want that. I want more of it. I want more of it. That's how good the connection with the Almighty is. Because that's what our souls really, we're running around all day looking for what? For that connection. Hashem says, look, that's, that's the opportunity you have on Shabbos. To be able to connect. Hashem should give us the opportunity to find that special mitzvah that connects us with Him. With no, with no limitations with no boundaries. And we should have, feel the love, feel the pleasure, and feel the joy of that closeness. Have an amazing Shabbos, my dear friends.